God is. I'm not speaking this morning. My wife and I just celebrated our 21st anniversary and didn't know if I would be here. But God has a word for you this morning. Sister Mary, I did, I'd never heard that song before this morning. And it ties in so perfectly with the message that God has laid on Sister Debbie's heart. Do me a favor this morning. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes to the Holy Spirit. As soon as she sang a while ago, questioning, God, do you still love me? I didn't even catch that the first time she sang it this morning. The Holy Spirit began to tug upon my heart. There's some of you in here this morning. Because of the things that you've been going through, you've questioned, God, don't you see? Don't you care, God? you're having trouble sleeping at night. It's difficult for you to come to church. It's even more difficult for you to praise Him. I believe God has brought you here this morning a divine appointment to bring healing to open your eyes. That you've not lost Him and you certainly have not lost hope. There come seasons, every head bowed, every eye closed. There come seasons where the enemy will rattle to the core of your faith, and you'll have to choose. Do you believe what you have preached? Do you believe what you've heard? Do you believe what's in the Word? When my daughter was, I was told that she had cancer, and I thought she would die, and I I knelt by my bed. I'd been on this emotional roller coaster for so long, angry at God, frustrated, questioning And then I would get upset with myself that I was like that to God. But one night by my bedside, tears streaming down my face. I threw my hands in the air and and I didn't even realize at the time that she sang that song this morning. That's what I did. I chose that night to worship God. I threw my hands in the air and I said, God, I thought my baby would die. I said, God, you know this is not what I want. But I love you, God. I do trust you, God. And I will worship you anyway. I made my mind up. I chose that night that I would be faithful to God. And the next time we go to the doctor, they can't find anything wrong with my baby. I found a breakthrough when I learned to just trust God and let God have it. I'm telling you this morning, you can trust God. God is faithful. Amen. Whatever you may be facing. Sister Debbie, would you come on up? Because God has anointed her with the word. She is a dear friend of mine from Fort Mill Church of God. An anointed speaker and a, a mighty woman of God. And she serves and, and wears about every hat, I think, except the title of pastor. But I think she, she does everything, including preaching at her church. Um, and she is truly a gift. And we're honored to have her this morning. Would you make her feel welcome? Thank you. Thank you so much. What an honor and a privilege it is to be here this morning. I, I do love to speak God's word. And I was so excited to see where you're going to begin a Celebrate Recovery. I am also uh, the minister over Celebrate Recovery at our church. It's been going uh, about about six years, and it is more than a program. It is a ministry. It is introducing people to Jesus Christ, but also breaking bondages that has held them bound for so many years. We have many that have been uh, delivered from alcoholism. One man, he was addicted for 35 years. And the power of the Holy Spirit broke that bondage over his life. There's a gentleman that I met at Kershaw Correctional that started coming to Fort Mill. And I told a little bit of his story this morning. He woke up in an ambulance with a sheet over his head. They declared him dead from a drug overdose, but God. He is one of my leaders in Celebrate Recovery. And what was ironic, I didn't realize it, but in your congregation this morning was one of the men I taught at Kershaw. He's been visiting your church. And I'm just so thankful. I said, how are you doing? He said, me and the Lord are doing great. And so that's good to know that God is still in control. He is still on the throne. But you're going to see wonderful, God do wonderful things just by saying you can come here. This is a safe place there you can just be you and we're going to introduce you to the grace and the deliverance of Jesus Christ so I'm so thankful you're starting that particular ministry here at the here at uh, I was going to say the Fort Mill Church of God <laughs> so we're just so glad you're starting this at Lexington Church of God too and it doesn't matter if they have one every day of the week people need to be 
where, the, where they can be filled every night and experience that ministry. I'm going to be speaking on it to you today, and I know Pastor Mark, he has tried to steal my message twice today. Two times he's tried to steal it, and, and then uh, Sister Fail singing that beautiful song, she had no clue what I was going to be speaking on today, but I'm going to be speaking to you from the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, if you want to turn there. I'm only going to read one verse at this time, but I will be referring to other scriptures, and that's Hebrews chapter 6. And if you would indulge me, if you would just stand for the reading of God's word, Hebrews 6, and I'm going to read verse 19. Hebrews 6, 19 says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that we do have hope in Jesus Christ. He is the hope of the world. And Lord, I pray that you would use me today to speak with clarity and boldness what you have proclaimed to your people. And we place this service and our lives into your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. It has been kind of funny as we end 2016, I have heard more people this year say, I will be so glad when this year is over. Now, I don't know why turning the page on the calendar is going to make a difference, but I do know who can. That is Jesus Christ. I don't know if 2016 was the best year of your life or the worst year of your life, or for me, one of the toughest years of my life. But either way, I, we think about this, and sometimes we'll make resolutions or promises or will decree, I'm going to have a better life next year. I'm going to do better and be better. I'm, I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to watch what I eat. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to go to the gym. And like I said this morning, we go to the gym and ride right by as we're going to Sheely's. Just keep on driving. Oh, there's the gym. There we go. Oh, I went by there. You know, that's about all we get done after the first few weeks. You know, we want women, we like to get organized. You know, we'll clean out closets and cabinets and buy baskets and all these little bins to put things in just to be organized. And the whole time what we're wanting is our life to be different in this new year. And so when I thought about this particular passage of Scripture, this hope, I thought, where is there hope in the world? Because as we look at the world, I don't see a lot of hope. I see more tragedies and travesties than ever before, genocides and nations. You see tsunamis and earthquakes that are taking a toll on people's lives. You see these, uh, the worst foe I think that we've ever faced is ISIS that we've known in, in modern times is this, this enemy called ISIS. We've never experienced an enemy like that before. And then we look at our nation. Our nation, all you hear on the news is people who are dying or being killed or murdered. You hear of abuse. You hear of neglect more and more and more than you ever have ever before. When I went to school, the only thing my parents worried about was that would I get hurt on the playground. Now when you send your kids to school, you're worried that they're going to get shot while they're at school. We hear now of human trafficking in America like never before. Used to it was a third world country's problem. Now it's a problem not only in the metro areas of America, but right in our own neighborhoods. That people that are held hostage or in slavery to human trafficking. And then within our own families, just looking at our own families under our own roof, our biological brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews, more addictions, more alcoholism, more drug abuse, even prescription uh, drugs that's holding people captive. We find that now our young people at an alarming rate are cutting themselves and committing suicide because they just can't face it. Young children that just darkness has clouded their life. And when we look at this, we go, God, where are you? Is there any hope? Nothing is changing. And I'm reminded of the scripture that says, you will have tribulation in this world. You will be persecuted, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. 
I want you to know you are going to face tough times. That is a part of life. It will happen. If it hap hasn't happened to you already, it will. I can tell you that is the truth. Every one of us will uh, face things that maybe we never thought that we would have to face in our lifetime, but we're seeing it come to pass. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is addressing. He is addressing believers. He is addressing people that were Jewish converts to the Christian faith. And he's having to remind them who Jesus Christ really is. That he is superior to all things. He is fully God, but when he came, he was fully man. He was the better sacrifice. He is the better high priest because he is the great high priest. And in Hebrews 6, in this passage of scripture, he is writing to them to remind them this hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. He's reminding them, be encouraged. Be encouraged. And he uses a great example in verse 13 by Abraham. It's almost like he's presenting a court case. And exhibit A is Abraham, a great man of faith. But I like in verse 15 where it says that he patiently endured. Stay right there for just a moment. I'm sorry. Go back. You had it right. But God made a promise to Abraham. He said, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. God called Abram and Sarai out. He said, come out from where you are. I'm going to take you to a place that you know not of. Abram and Sarai were obedient to the Lord. There was a promise that was made over their life that out of them every nation of the world would be blessed. But they had no children. And they ended up in Cana, didn't even have a house to live in, had to live in a tent. Now, God told them to go there. You would have thought he'd have built them a house while they were on their way. But when they got there, they lived in a tent. Lot had come with Abram. That was his nephew. He had to go and rescue Lot, uh, uh, rescue him from five enemy kings. He ended up paying tithes to Melchizedek. Abram was doing the right thing, and God came and renewed covenant with him. Changed his name to Abraham and Sarah's name to Sarai's name to Sarah. But he made a promise to them. And this whole time, Abraham is patiently enduring. Now, I want you to notice that word enduring. It's just saying Abraham went through some stuff. Now, you keep in mind, he, they had gone to Egypt. He told lies. He brings back an Egyptian slave girl that is the maidservant for his wife. He has a child with this Egyptian maidservant. His child's name is Ishmael, but he still was not the promised son. Now, can you just imagine living in a household with two women who are jealous of one another? He endured a lot. A lot of enduring went on in that household. But we find that 25 years later, in Genesis 21, it says that the Lord kept his word and did exactly for Sarah just what he promised. He waited on the Lord. And Abraham is that great example that the writer of Hebrews is giving to the people. He patiently endured. The people at that time were going through great persecution. They did not realize that being a Christian was going to cause them so much trouble. They didn't realize what they were going to be facing during that time. And they are just about ready to give up. They are just about ready to throw in the towel. I can't do this. I can't take this anymore. But I want to remind you that the writer of Hebrews is telling them that there is a promise that is for all of us. It is for you. It is for the seed of Abraham. And in Galatians 3 and 29, it says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. He promises us today, just like the writer in the book of Hebrews did to the Jewish believers that you are an heir of Abraham. And every promise that was made is yours. And God does not go back 
on his promise. God cannot lie. We see in Hebrews 6 verse 17 that God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability, the unchanging of his counsel. He cannot lie. He is That is for us today. It stands as an oath. It stands as a guarantee. But in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, it says, And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life that I did not even know how God was going to fix it. I didn't know how God was going to come through. I didn't know how I was going to make it another day. And all of a sudden, I would begin to pray or worship the Lord. And I want you to know the Holy Spirit would just begin to pray in an unknown tongue in that heavenly language. And I just had to stop and remember, that's my guarantee. He gave me a guarantee. I might not know what I just prayed in that heavenly language. I might not understand what he was speaking through me. But what I did know, he guaranteed he'd be with me and never leave me. He gave me that guarantee and he put that guarantee in me by the Holy Ghost. I'm so thankful that he gave us the Holy Spirit to live in us. And he sent his spirit to be a guarantee. His promises are yes and amen. They cannot be canceled. They cannot run out of an expiration date. They are everlasting and they are eternal. You can be confident of that. That's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell them. Don't worry. Don't fret. You can be confident in this. As a matter of fact, it says that it can be a strong consolation. This is not a, a booby prize or, oh, you didn't really win, so you're going to have to get, you know, the second place prize. No, this is a strong consolation for us. It is an encouragement. He knew that we would need to be encouraged. I thought about um, Apollo 13 in, the in 1970. Those of you that are old enough to remember this. I can remember our church coming together to pray for those three astronauts that they were doomed in, uh, in space and did not know if they were going to make it back. And if you don't remember anything else, you'll remember these words. Houston, we have a problem. Well, church, it's time we recognized we have a problem. You might need to realize that in your family and in your life. We got a problem. But what we don't want to do is focus on the problem and stay in the problem. What we got to remember is Lexington Church of God, we got a promise. Amen. We got a promise. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I recognize there's a problem. There's an enemy that is raging because he knows his time is almost up. He is after the young, the old, the men, the women, the children, and the elderly. He is after us all. Do you think that he's just because you said, I've made up my mind, he's going to leave you alone? He's been after me since the day I was born. They told my mother and daddy when they went out of the hospital without me, plan her funeral. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> I want you to know I had to have somebody that come with my, my mom and dad's side to remind them we got a promise. <laughs> we have a promise. Yes, I realize there's some things going on in our life. I know that there's persecution and tribulation, but we have a promise. And Abraham was that example to the people in the book of Hebrews. It was Abraham. But what if you're not patiently enduring? What if you're more like a woman like Naomi in the book of Ruth who went back to Bethlehem and said, don't call me Naomi, which means cheerful. Call me Mara, which means bitter. 
She says, because the Lord has brought me back empty. She had felt like she lost everything in Moab. Her and her husband, Imelech, had left Bethlehem, which is house of bread, because of a famine. And for all places for them to go was Moab, a place where they worship Molech, where they put their children through the fire. And while they're there, her sons marry Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. But she loses her husband and both of her sons. And I'm telling you, when you've made decisions like that, and when you've made choices like that, you begin to lose hope. You begin to feel empty. When you've buried people that are close to you and you're standing by their graveside, you, sometimes you'll lose hope. Your hope will begin to fade. When you bury a vision that you felt like God gave you and it looks like it's dead. When you lose a dream, a ministry that you're just, it's just dead and buried, you'll begin to lose hope. She had given all she had. She had lost everything. She was empty. There was no hope. As a matter of fact, when you lose hope, it'll cause you to do crazy things. It'll cause you to make rash decisions. And it will cause you to push people away. And that's what she tried to do to her daughter-in-laws. I don't have anything to offer you. Go back. Go back. Don't come with me. I don't have anything to give you. But I am so thankful when Ruth and Naomi got to Bethlehem, there was a kinsman redeemer who stepped on the scene as a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ by the name of Boaz. And he began to redeem everything that Naomi had lost. He and Ruth got married. They had a son. But what I like at the end of the story, they gave the baby to Naomi. He said his name is Obed, which means worshiper. And look, God has given Naomi a son in her old age. I want you to know that Naomi came back to Bethlehem focusing on the problem. I'm empty. I'm bitter. I've gave up too much. There is no hope. But I want you to know when the Redeemer stepped in, now she's a woman who's holding hope. She's a woman who's holding promise. She's a woman that's no longer focused on the problem. She's focused on the problem. Because you see, Obed, he begot Jesse. And Jesse begot King David, who through his line came the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. I want you to know what's what God will do. When you feel like you've gave up too much, when you feel like you've cost you too much, I want you to remember that you can hang on to hope, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. This hope is an anchor for our soul. I want to come by here on this first Sunday, this first day of the year, to remind you there is hope no matter what you're going through there is hope that is an anchor for the soul that is sure and steadfast there is promises that God has spoken to your life that you forgot about it's been so long ago you've forgotten that God ever spoke that into your life I've come by here today to tell you the promise is not dead he's just getting you ready he's just putting things in order I want you to remember Remember, this hope is an anchor for the soul. When I look at this particular passage of Scripture, I thought about an anchor. And of course we know that an anchor on a ship, they will sometimes, they will ride out the storm. But sometimes they'll have to put the anchor down to keep the ship from tipping over, from it being totally destroyed. So in a storm, we have to remember, I've got an anchor that it keep me steady and firm and steadfast. But we also need to remember they put down an anchor in calm water. When the water is calm, they'll let down the anchor to keep it from drifting off course. Because you see, if they don't put the anchor down, the ship will finally go into rocks and be damaged. The, The ship will get so far off course that it'll get caught up in reeds And if we're not careful, that's what will happen to us. You see, if we don't hold to this anchor, we'll begin to drift. Calm. Everything's going good. Everything's going great. And it's like we're lulled to sleep. 
everything's wonderful. And before you know it, we are so far off course that we'll look and go, how did I get here? We have to remember this hope, the hope that we have in the promises of God. The hope we have through Jesus Christ is an anchor that is sure and steadfast. Maybe you can relate to Abraham that you have patiently endured. Or maybe you relate to Naomi. I've buried a lot of things. And I've buried a lot of people. And I'm just empty. I'm empty. Or maybe you are somebody like me, just an average person that has gone through just stuff in their life. And I thought about, with, with my particular case, um, my son was four years old. My daughter was just a few months old. I had been laid off from my job at Texas Instruments, had worked there for 10 years. And I came home from work one day, and my husband was gone. He had actually packed his stuff taken a second mortgage out on the house, emptied our bank account, and canceled every credit card we had. And I am standing there, what are we going to do? What? What have I done? What? God, why did you let this happen? Angry with God, angry with him. And, and I didn't know what I was going to do. How am I going to pay for this house? I, I started working five part-time jobs just to get by. I'm doing all that I can. I'm still, well, how am I going to feed these kids? And I remembered the promise. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, <laughs> nor his seed begging for bread. I also remember the voice of the enemy saying, your children are going to be warped. That's the words, warped. They will never lead a normal life. And according to the numbers, that's true. They need a two-parent household. They need a mom and a dad in their life. But I didn't have that. And it wasn't my choice. But I didn't have that. The enemy told me, your son will never know how to be a man. He will question his sexual identity every day of his life. Your daughter, she's going to fall into the arms of any man that comes her way trying to find a father figure. And this is what's worse. I believed it. I believed that's what was going to happen to my children. I said, I'm, going, I'm such a failure. I'm a failure as a mom. I would make mistakes and I'd beat my stuff up. And I, I can remember, though, I'd keep speaking in their life, you're special. I love you. God loves you. You're going to make it. We're going to be all right. We're going to be okay. I, 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 my kids will tell you stories that made them stronger, not weaker. The times that we didn't have something and God showed up, I'm telling you, they know God is real. There were times that they didn't get to go have pizza. We couldn't afford pizza. We couldn't do all that stuff. They had to wear hand-me-down stuff and hand-me-down and hand-me-down stuff. They had to do all, without a lot of things, but we still had Jesus. <laughs> But I questioned every day of my life. I didn't see a lot of hope. All I kept thinking about, they're going to be warped. They're going to be warped. But when my son graduated from high school, they had them, all the seniors, to write down their uh, life mantra. You know, the words to live by. Some of them would write... Uh, living the dream or whatever it might be. This is what my son wrote, the one that the enemy said he would question who he was in Christ, that he would question his identity. This is what my son wrote. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Romans 8, 15. You see what my son did through all those trials and all those storms? He realized who his real daddy was. He realized who he was in Jesus Christ. He realized that he was a son of the living God. Now, I didn't brag on my daughter this morning, but let me just tell you about my daughter. She graduated valedictorian of her high school class. She's a young lady who graduated summa cum laude from Winthrop University. She's now employed with the state of South Carolina in DHEC that is now receiving honors for her master's degree in public health. And, oh, yeah, she still hadn't met the right one, and she's pure, and she's holy, and she knows God has him way 
bleeding in the side just at the right time. The devil is a liar. He is a liar. You can focus on the problem or you can focus on the promise. I had to focus on the problem many times in my life. I also had to remember this hope we have. Oh, if he, Jesus lives in your heart, you have hope. There is always hope that is the anchor of your soul, both sure and steadfast. But there are times I felt all alone. Like it was just me and nobody else. And I had to remind myself of the promises of God. Lo, I am with you always. I will be the lover of your soul. That's what Jesus said. I am all that you need. I had to remember that all the mess I made, and I made some messes in my life. I mean, I did it on my own and made messes. But I had to remember what God's word says. For I know that all things will work together for my good to those who are called according, that love God and are the called according to his purpose. That he would work all things out for my good. I had to remember when I have low self-esteem, low self-worth, that he spoke and he said, I will bless you going in and I'll bless you going out. You are the head and not the tail. I had to remember when I felt like I was defeated in Christ. I am more than a conqueror. I had to remember when I felt like I couldn't do anything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I could focus on the problem or I could focus on the promise. Turn to your neighbor and say, we got a promise. We've got a promise. We've got a problem. I know that we've got the problem, but we, more importantly, we've got a promise. We have an anchor for our soul that is sure and steadfast. I don't know what you're facing that last year or facing this year. Only God knows, but I want you to know he is that anchor that will hold you. I don't know if you're like Abraham, patiently enduring. If you're like Naomi, that you just feel empty. Just empty. I've given so much. Or like me, where you question everything that you were doing. And you believed what the enemy was saying instead of the promises of God. That there is a hope. There, we have promises that are yes and amen. You have a problem, but more importantly, we have a promise. This hope. Whatever you're facing next year, whatever you go through next year, I want you to remember this hope is an anchor for your soul. If you'll hold on to him, if you'll hold on to the promises, if you will choose to allow him to be the guiding light, he will lead you every step of the way. Stand to your feet. We have a promise that this hope is an anchor for the soul. Let us pray. Lord, I just come to you in the name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to move in this place today. God, I ask you to move upon our hearts and our lives. And let us just be honest for a moment. There are times we have all felt like Naomi. I'm empty. I'm empty. I don't have anything else to give. I don't have anything else to offer. I'm empty. And then there's some of us that are like me that feel like a failure so many times. And there have been times your word has had to carry me through when nothing else would. But God, today you've sent me by here to stir up hope. God, I brought hope to your people today. God, I, I want to encourage them today, just like the writer of Hebrews. Holy Spirit, you are the guarantee. I'm calling upon you, Holy Spirit, Lord, to move upon your people. If you are here today with every head bowed and eyes closed, if you would say, I've never asked Jesus into my life. I've never asked him into my heart. I don't know about this hope you're talking about. Will you quickly raise your hand if that's anybody here, anybody in this congregation, anybody at all, or perhaps you're here today and you're saying, I don't want my life to be the same next year as it was last year. 
I don't want the same thing. I don't want to live that same life. I need you, God, to do something new in my life in 2017. I see those hands. You can put them down. If you're here today and you say, I'm a believer, but I'm empty. I'm just empty. I need this hope once again to reign true in my life. I need somebody to encourage me and pray with me. I want to pray for you today. I want to give you, once again, encouragement. Give you hope for what God has promised in your life. Lord, right now, do your work. Holy Spirit, begin to move in Jesus' name. Come forward. If you need prayer, Pastor Mark... Pastor Frank, who's here with me from the church, we'd love to pray with you and pray for you. If you need prayer, if you need encouragement, please come. If you want life to be different this year, please come. Please come. feet of Jesus the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus we fall down we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lamb, and we cry, Holy, 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 and we cry, Holy, 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 and we cry, Holy, 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 holy is the Lamb. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy. Holy, and we cry, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lamb. And we cry, Holy, 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 and we cry, Holy, 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 and we cry, Holy, Holy. Holy is the Lamb. As these here at the altar continue to pray this morning, I want to encourage you. We're going to sing this song again. 
I want you to think about what you're singing. I shared this with the choir this morning when we were practicing in the service earlier today. The song says, we fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. And my thoughts were, the very first time I heard this years and years ago, I thought, I don't have a crown. But the more I thought about it, the more that I began to realize that our crowns are those things that we kind of set up for ourselves. Maybe it's our toys or maybe it's our worries. Basically, our crowns are those things that we kind of build up in our head, those things that become our focus, those things that become more important than actually concentrating and focusing on the Savior. I don't know what your, what your crown looks like today. Maybe it's a nice, beautiful crown that you take a whole lot of pride in placing a whole lot of jewels on, or maybe it's kind of plain and simple, but the whole point is the thing that sets a king aside from everyone else is his crown. His crown is his identity. When he takes off that crown, he becomes just like everybody else. But see, that's what Jesus was. He was a king that came as a baby. He laid aside that crown so that he could come and serve. And that's our job, to take on that identity, to lay our crowns to the side, good, bad, ugly, whatever it is. I want you to make that proclamation right now and for the rest of this year, Lord. We're going to lay our crowns to the side, Lord. We're going to fall at your feet. We're going to fall faces to the ground. The ground is dirty, dirt all over it, mud, grime. None of that stuff matters. What's important is I'm going to worship you. What's important is I'm going to praise you, Lord. And I'm just going to be there to serve, God, those that are around me, to minister to the hurt and the dying. Sing it with me one more time. We fall down. Sing it from your heart. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. Sing that again. We fall down. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry holy and we cry holy, holy, holy. And we cry holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, 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 he is the Lamb. Come on, just your voice to sing it again. And we cry, holy, 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 and we cry, holy, 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 and we cry, holy, holy, Holy is the Lamb. Lord, we lay our crowns to the side and worship the King. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lamb. Oh, now come on and just lift up your hands all across this room. In those old cowboy movies, anytime somebody came at them with a gun, their way of surrendering was just throwing up their hands. I give up. And when you're surrendering today, think of it from the mindset of, Lord, I have no control over what's coming this year. I don't know what's coming my way, but Lord, I surrender it to you because I know that you're working it out. I know that you're fixing it, Lord. I know that I keep saying the same thing over and over again, but God, it's that message that's resounding in my heart, Lord, that you're working it all out. I don't have to worry about it. I surrender to your will and to your way, Lord, not my will, but your will be done in 2017. Lord, we set the tone right now. We worship you. We praise you just simply because of who you are. The King of kings. 
the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and Omega and everything in between. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you for it. And if you agree with that prayer, say amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming this morning. We hope to see you back on Wednesday night.